Welcome to Module 6. This is the sixth installment in the Emerging Infectious Disease videos for pre-hospital providers series. In this video, we will be discussing personnel decontamination and care of providers after completion of patient-related activities. This instructional series was created by the University of Maryland Baltimore County Department of Emergency Health Services with assistance from the Maryland Department of Health, the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems, and funding from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In this module, we will define the term decontamination. We will review the modes of exposure, sites of entrance, and the substances that can transport pathogens that carry disease. We will also discuss the process of exposure decontamination, the most effective hand hygiene methods, and the most effective clothing or uniform decontamination methods. Please note that the methods and protocols used in this video may be different than what is used in your jurisdiction. If they exist, you should always follow your jurisdictional protocols for decontamination. Decontamination is the process of removing or destroying pathogens and therefore preventing microorganisms from spreading and causing disease. In this module, we will focus on the process of provider decontamination. We will discuss ambulance and equipment decontamination in the next module. Decontamination is performed as a component of exposure control. The appropriate use of personal protective equipment and staying up to date on necessary vaccinations are, in conjunction with decontamination, the primary preventative measures to protect yourself and those around you from exposure to infectious diseases. You should take three main factors into consideration when dealing with exposures to infectious diseases. The mode of transmission, or how the exposure happened, the substance that you were exposed to, and the site of entrance, or how the pathogens entered your body. Let's quickly revisit the multipathogen approach to PPE. In this case, we are looking at this material in terms of decontamination. As we learned in previous modules, there are numerous ways in which pathogens can enter your body. The role of decontamination is to prevent those pathogens from coming into contact with you. As you look at this chart, you see that the pathogens can be transmitted to us via contact, droplet, or airborne mechanisms. The mode of transmission of the pathogen will determine which type of decontamination the provider may need to employ after patient care has been transferred. For example, after transferring care of a patient with C. diff, the provider should take extra care to wash their hands with soap and water instead of just alcohol-based hand sanitizer prior to returning to service. The substances which providers could be exposed to that may potentially carry microbial diseases include blood, saliva, airway secretions such as mucus, amniotic fluid, vomit, feces, urine, and wound secretions. Hand hygiene should be performed before direct patient contact, before donning gloves and other PPE, before inserting any medical devices, before preparing or administering medications or injections, before eating, drinking, or handling food, and before you go home at the end of your shift. This will help protect your families and loved ones from potential exposure to pathogens you may have come into contact with at work. A good rule of thumb to remember is, anytime you touch something, you're transferring something. The same concept is true for performing hand hygiene methods after certain activities. Hand hygiene should be performed after each patient contact, after contact with blood or bodily fluids, after contact with a patient's skin, after transfer of care at the hospital, after removing gloves and other protective equipment, and after cleaning and disinfecting the ambulance. Keep in mind that many common surfaces, such as doorknobs, steering wheels, railings, and oxygen bottle valves are often contaminated. You will also want to be sure to thoroughly clean your hands after having contact with objects in a patient's vicinity or after touching many of the surfaces in the patient compartment 
as well as after handling objects that might be contaminated with blood or other potentially infectious materials. Of course, throughout daily life, you will also want to thoroughly wash your hands after using the toilet and after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. There are five simple steps that you must follow when washing your hands. Wet, lather, scrub, rinse, and dry. Here is a demonstration of the five steps. First, wet your hands with clean running water and apply soap. Rub your hands together using a rotating motion to cover all surfaces, including the back of your hands. Interlace your fingers and rub up and down to cover the area between the fingers. Scrub under and around the fingernails. Keep scrubbing for at least 20 seconds. Rinse your hands by placing them at a downward angle under the clean running water. Finally, use a clean disposable paper towel and thoroughly dry your hands. Use the paper towel to turn off the faucet, turn off the light, and to turn the doorknob. Discard the paper towel properly into the waste receptacle. If paper towels are not available, allow your hands to air dry. If soap and water are not available, alcohol-based hand sanitizers may be used in the field. However, providers should wash their hands with soap and water at the first available opportunity as alcohol-based hand sanitizers are not effective against certain kinds of pathogens such as C. diff. When using alcohol-based hand sanitizers, make sure to thoroughly rub your hands with the hand sanitizer and cover all surfaces, including the area between your fingers and under your fingernails, just as you would if you were washing your hands with soap and water. To complete the hand washing discussion, please note that fingernails, particularly the underside of fingernails, can be a great place for microbes to hide, multiply, and be transferred to other surfaces like your food, doorknobs, and other people. Natural fingernails should be clean and short. It is also good practice to keep the edges of your fingernails rounded so they don't inadvertently cut skin or gloves. Artificial fingernails or extenders should not be worn while providing direct patient care. Providers should remove jewelry before patient contact if possible. If this is not possible, make sure to wash your jewelry with soap and warm water. Additionally, if you have any kind of open hand wounds or dermatitis, refrain from direct patient contact until the condition heals. It is time for a learning checkpoint. Watch this short video and see if you can identify the errors the provider made. If you said the provider did not adequately lather and scrub their hands while washing, then you are correct. The person washing their hands did not cover all surfaces of their hands. Remember, proper hand hygiene means scrubbing all surfaces of the hands. The front, the back, and between the fingers. Here is another short video. Watch and see if you can identify what the provider is doing wrong. If you said the provider dried their hands on their uniform rather than using a clean paper towel, then you are correct. You should never use your uniform to dry your hands. This results in your clean hands becoming covered in any microbes that may have been on your uniform. 
Providers should always use a clean disposable towel to dry their hands. If disposable towels are not available, let your hands air dry. Clothing and uniforms can also become contaminated with potentially infectious pathogens during patient care. Contaminated clothes should be changed as soon as possible and washed separately with hot water and laundry detergent. It is recommended that hot water washing be performed for a minimum of 25 minutes at a temperature of at least 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Washing machines should be rinsed with a cup of bleach after washing and removing the contaminated clothes. It is recommended that providers do not wash potentially contaminated clothing in their own washing machines at home. Instead, clothes and uniforms should be washed and tumble dried separately at the fire or EMS station to reduce the chance of bringing infectious microbes into your home. Make sure that you are using gloves and eye protection when handling contaminated clothes. Until you are able to wash or discard your clothing and personal items that are contaminated, they should be double bagged in plastic bags and sealed to prevent any potential cross-contamination. It is recommended that pre-hospital providers wear impermeable shoes while on duty. In the case that shoes become contaminated during patient care, they can be decontaminated by scrubbing them with soap and hot water then letting them dry completely. Another method to decontaminate shoes after a potential exposure is to use EPA registered disinfectant wipes. When using this method, providers should thoroughly wipe the tops, sides, and bottoms of their shoes with the disinfectant wipes. Additionally, the soles of the footwear should be washed thoroughly as soon as possible. Use of a spray disinfectant on the soles of the shoes may significantly improve the chance of killing microbes found there. Shoes that have porous fabric, like certain tennis shoes, might be hard to decontaminate, and it is recommended that you appropriately discard them when contaminated and replace them with new ones. The living quarters of EMS stations can also be a source of microbial transmission. Therefore, Make sure you have taken every opportunity to wash, change clothing, and otherwise perform personal hygiene and decontamination prior to entering your living quarters or returning home. Thank you for joining us for Module 6. Additional resources can be found in the links below this video. In the next module, we will discuss infectious waste disposal and equipment decontamination.